Okay, we're gonna just open up to allow welcome people in. So Stedbert's coming, he said. Okay, he's on the way in, okay. We can welcome people as they're joining here. Uh, friend, friends and colleagues from around the world. So. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those of you that are joining us. Thank you for participating. We're going to wait a few more minutes just as people log in and then we'll get started. I just encourage you all to please stay on mute. Yeah. Thank you. All. And if if I could ask people to put themselves on mute as they're joining, that would be awesome. And we do have the chat function, which you can find in the bottom center part of your screen. And you're most welcome to to put greetings there or questions and comments as we get started. Dr. Sedward, you can see me. I cannot I just get you to do a quick sound check just so I can make sure I can hear you okay. Yeah, I've, I have nothing on my screen right now, David. Just bear with me. Okay, I can see you and I can hear you. Can you? Yeah. So don't do anything inappropriate. Yeah. <laughs> you got that right. Uh, wow. Well. So, so again, to those who are joining, if I could get you to put, put yourselves on mute, just so that we can hear the speakers. And if you're wanting to, you're most welcome to use the chat function uh, to say a quick hello and say where you're from. So everyone gets a chance to know kind of who's here, but not, not, not a requirement. You won't get a participation mark as a result. And we are recording and we have the uh, Otter transcript. If you need a transcription up on the top there, you can click into that. Good, well, I think we can probably kick it off here. All right, well again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I think, I think Eli, this is our 11th or 12th Stedward talk. Um, these were initiated a number of years ago uh, by myself. I'm David Legg. I'm a faculty member at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And Eli Wolf, uh, my colleague who's joining us here today, and he's joining us from Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. And he and I are Paralympic fans. I don't know. <laughs> interested individuals, we find it interesting. Uh, Eli himself participated in the Paralympic Games um, as, a, as, a, as a soccer player. I did not, although I have attended a number of Paralympic Games and I was a graduate student of Dr. Stedwards, who is the founding president of the International Paralympic Committee, hence the name of these talks, uh, which, we've, which we've named in his honor as the Stedward Talks. And the purpose of these talks, again, which we initiated a number of years ago, is really to have an opportunity to talk about various aspects within the Paralympic sport system and community uh, from a historical perspective. And so looking at the past to understand the present and the future. And so in some instances, we've looked at particular sports like a sitting volleyball. In other instances, we've looked more at issues such as inclusion in the Commonwealth Games. And today, we're very excited to have the opportunity, uh, particularly in light of the Paralympic Games, Winter Games starting in Beijing on Friday evening uh, from a Western Canadian context, is to look at uh, sport for development and its impact and its historical uh, connection to the Paralympic movement, and then allowing us to then think about how this is going to have an impact moving forward on the future of the Paralympic movement and its connection to uh, human rights, um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability, and other sport for development initiatives. We have to... So again, as a reminder, if people could just put themselves on mute, that would be awesome. Thank you. Uh, and so we have three awesome speakers with us this morning. This is a, a, a transcontinental uh, perspective. We've got Jenny Wong, who is joining us this morning from London, England. We've got Juan Pablo, who's actually in Buenos Aires, uh, who's originally from uh, Colombia. And we've got Amy, who's joining us from Rhode Island uh, in the beautiful United States and East Coast of the United States. 
But, and we'll, we'll start with Dr. Stedward talking about his perspective on the historical context as it relates to sport for development. But before we do that, um, I wanted to pass it to Eli Wolf, my co-host, who's going to talk about, again, his, his role with sport, uh, uh, sport for Disability and kind of how we're one of the co-hosts of this event. So over to you, Eli. Yeah, and no, I just, again, just briefly wanted to, to welcome everyone. I'm really looking forward to this really important and timely conversation, looking at the history of, uh, of the Paralympic movement, uh, sport for development, human rights, education. Um, really amazing to have our, our panelists today. Um, yeah, and just briefly, you know, our team uh, has been working on disability and sport over the last, you know, 20 years now um, with uh, David, myself, and then uh, Ted Fay, who's joined, Mary Hums, several others. So kind of that history of work um, kind of and, and sort of the founding. So obviously the, my role as an athlete and fan, but also as a scholar, as an educator, as an advocate. Um, and our team has kind of been at the forefront of that in, in many ways over the years. And uh, but really this opportunity to have the Stepford Talks uh, again, this is our 10th or 11th and, uh, and just really looking forward to the conversation. So I'll turn it back over to David to then introduce uh, Dr. Stedward. Thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is also being co-hosted by IFAPA, the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity, of which I am the current president. I can see one of our past presidents, Dr. Boussier from France, who's joining us this morning. Thank you, Claire, for participating. And I will put up the IFAPA website in a minute, just in case anybody is interested in finding out more about it. So without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Stedward, who's joining us this morning from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Dr. Stedward was my uh, supervisor for my PhD. He would describe that as probably his greatest achievement and accomplishment uh, in his academic career is ensuring that I actually graduated. No, no easy, easy path. Dr. Stedward is the founding president of the International Paralympic Committee after a long uh, history in sport uh, uh, for persons experiencing disability um, in some of its kind of nascent stages in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And we've asked Dr. Stedward to spend a little bit of time talking about his reflection on how the International Paralympic Committee um, in its earliest stages addressed issues related to sport for development, education, uh, human rights, etc. So Dr. Stedward, over to you for some opening remarks. And then we will start with Amy um, after, after you pro provide your opening remarks. And again, if I could encourage people to post any questions or comments that they wish into the chat function. Dr. Sedward, over to you and good morning. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating in, in the uh, Stedward Talks and a very special uh, thank you for, uh, to Amy and Juan Pablo and Jennifer. I'm so pleased uh, to have you join us and I look forward to your comments uh, through the discussions this morning. Uh, what I thought I would do is to remind you that the Paralympic movement is and was a very complicated organization and development. And when we talk about sport, when we talk about education, human rights, uh, uh, equity, and some of the issues that we've had to face over the years, I'd like to give you a thumbnail sketch of the early years in the beginning, because if we all appreciate and understand those early beginnings, it might help us reflect and it might help us deal with today's uh, issues. So uh, please remember that between 1960 and 1975, there was a series of international Stoke Mandeville games that took place each year. And Dr. Stedward, we lost you just very quickly there. You went on mute.
I'm just pressing to underneath. Oh, we got you. You're, it looks, looks like you're yeah, and you had just finished talking about the Stoke Van Bill games. See, oh, okay. I was I was listening just to just to, just to be very clear. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, uh, we have to uh, appreciate and understand that the early developments, and I'm not going to go into the 1948 to, to 1960 because uh, there were all sorts of uh, developments taking place around the world uh, for people with disability. But when we talk about the quote Paralympic movement per se, from 60 to 75. Um, they were only uh, wheelchair games for spinal cord injured. There was no other disabilities that were invited or part of the movement, i.e. Uh, amputees, les autres, cerebral palsy, and visually impaired. So right away, we have uh, an issue uh, in that other disabilities were not an integral part until 1976, when the, we had uh, multi-disabled games at the time, and at the same time, the creation of the Winter Paralympic Games. But now let's jump forward a little bit more now and see that in 1980, uh, the games were held in Arnhem in the Netherlands. And once again, this is where uh, cerebral palsy and les ultra were added added to the games, but all through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the Paralympic Games or the uh, International Stoke Mandeville Games were only held in two Olympic cities and Olympic countries. So right away, we we weren't part of the bigger international sports scene or sport family. So there were some issues there. Along with that, we had some organizational and structural issues in that sport for athletes living with a disability were based and were controlled by the four or well, the six ISODs, the president, the secretary general and the technical officer. They were the ones who were controlling sport. There was no involvement from athletes, from sports, from nations and the like. And this is, I guess, what prompted me to put together a document that looked at a new world structure, which led to the Arnhem Seminar in 1987. And it was there that 23 resolutions were put forward. And of these 23 resolutions, there were six that were really crucial. The first one is it was unanimous by all of the nation's presence that there needed to be a new structure and governance for sport for athletes with a disability. We also agreed unanimously that we need to create a, um, a, a strategic committee, ad hoc committee to begin to lay down the framework of this structure and a constitution. Then some of the issues uh, that we had, not only on human rights, but other issues started to be uh, coming to the foreground that we wanted to deal with. We wanted to deal with reducing the number of classes. We wanted to be a sport model, not a medical model, because up until that stage, our entire movement internationally was run out of hospitals, rehab centers by doctors, nurses, physicians, et cetera. It wasn't by sport people. And the last couple of aspects is that we had to find ways of being integrated within the International Sport Federations and the IOC, and to also look at a way of being included within their movements, because that's where we're really gonna have to deal <clears throat> with some of our current and future um, uh, human rights uh, issues. So 1988, remember Seoul, South Korea. That was the very first time where we started to develop the modern Paralympic Games. And it was here where I had an opportunity to present uh, Sam Ranch, who was the president of the IOC, to present him with our new document, not yet passed or accepted, but at least he knew what we were trying to achieve. So from then on, 
our games were held in the cities and countries of the Olympic Games. So, and lastly, that I just wanted to bring forward to your attention is that when we start talking about the Paralympic movement, human rights education, <clears throat> we have to think of Vista 93 in 1993, after IPC was created in 89, we started looking at some of the issues. Before that, we were just scrambling to try to put together a new international organization, to bring the countries together, to bring the athletes together, to start structuring by sport and the like. <clears throat> and then through uh, my 12 years as president from 89 to 2001, it took those 12 years to work closely with the president of the IOC, Sam Ranch, and the Olympic movement to bring together the most sophisticated and the most important historical document and agreement and legislation, which was the memorandum of understanding between our two organizations, which laid the foundation for our future. Then it was time to start looking at other major issues within our movement, women in sport, minimal disability, severely disabled, technical advancements in the wheelchair, um, boosting or uh, autonomic dysreflexia, uh, sport enhancement and drugs, uh, uh, doing more research, encouraging universities to become more involved in the Paralympic movement, helping third world countries, being involved with the United Nations uh, and the like. So those were all sorts of issues that we had to try to deal with but again, we were just fighting for our rights and our recognition at the time so that we could become a new organization. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, I wanted to just stir up a few thoughts here and also to give you an opportunity so that we have a basis from which to uh, base our discussions on, uh, on this morning. And I thank you ever so much for giving me that. Uh, opportunity to lay a little bit of uh, framework to our discussion. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing that, Dr. Sutter. And I, I would concur, I think from its earliest <laughs> nascent days, uh, issues related to human rights um, and sport for development were incumbent in the creation of the IPC and then evolved slowly, uh, perhaps more deliberately as the IPC evolved. So our first speaker uh, is Amy, and Amy, and, and actually I'll say this to all three of our speakers right now, if I could, if I could get you to introduce yourselves uh, professionally in so far as what you're doing presently, and then a little bit of perhaps about your background. And then what I'm wanting you to do is to talk about kind of your roles in initiating projects, building out a plan for sport, for development, um, as it relates to education, human rights, et cetera. So I'll get all three of our speakers to, to go one after the other, and I'll give you about five to eight minutes to, to do so one at a time. And then after we conclude that, we'll use the chat function and Eli and I will um, kind of engage in a conversation with our speakers through your comments on the chat function. So as you're listening to our speakers, please you know, include your questions and comments in the chat, and then we'll engage in a, in a broader conversation once they're all done their presentations. Amy. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, it's almost lunchtime for you in Rhode Island. Getting close. Uh, Thanks, thank David. You. Thank, thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you so much. It's it's really great to be here, and thank you for asking me to join and to talk about the experience I have um, with the Paralympic movement. Um, who am I? Um, my name is Amy Farkas Kara Georges. I'm currently working as a consultant in international development, disability rights, and sport for development. Um, I've worked for a variety of organizations, including UN agencies, the IPC, um, and, and a variety of others. I've also worked with Special Olympics. Um, so just uh, what do I bring? I think you'll see when I give my examples. I'll just, I'll keep it short. Um, I want to start out by just saying that, you know, my thoughts as we meet today um, are really also with the Ukrainian people. I think what we're talking about in terms of human rights really relates to what's happening in the world right now. And all of our friends that are on the Ukrainian Paralympic Committee are part of the movement. So um, my thoughts are with them as, as I speak and give some reflections. Um, I'm gonna share a lot of the information is based on my experience with the IPC from 2003 to 2008. 
Um, I'll try and highlight three things. And I think it might be helpful if we just start out um, with what is sport for development in case it's new to someone. Um, and you know, typically what we say and how we explain it is that sport for development and peace refers to an intentional use of sport, physical activity and play to attain um, specific development objectives. Um, some examples would be the sustainable development goals, which are part of agenda 2030 for sustainable development. So with that in mind, um, my first example of where I think the IPC has made a major impact in this area starts with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, as I joined the IPC in 2003, the CRPD, short for the convention, was actually in drafting phase. Um, and I was able to convince the president and the, the CEO at the time um, that it was really important that while it seems somewhat far away and vague, but if we could get the right um, text in the convention that would say sport is a right for people with disabilities, that a lot of other things would follow. Resources, um, accountability, that there would be all of the structure in place by which this was no longer sort of a side thing. This would then be part of a legitimate um, government approach that funding would follow, that accountability, as I said. So I was thankfully um, sent over and worked on the drafting with Eli and a few other people. We were sort of a core group advocating to the governments on what we wanted to see in there. And I think it's great because there is text in there now. Um, and it is one of the most uh, robust acknowledgements of sport being a right. And so for that, we have made major accomplishments. It doesn't clarify everything. It doesn't you know, answer all of the things, all of our wishes, but I think it's really important that we have that foundation now moving forward with all the countries that have ratified the convention. So it's a starting point for ensuring that what we're doing and talking about with the Paralympics is not seen as secondary or as something that is optional. Um, the, in terms of sport for development, you know, also when I joined the IPC, this is when there was more formalization going on around this movement, around the merging between the international development sector and um, sport. And while people knew that there was a, an impact sport could have, it was really starting in the early 2000s in certain events and conferences like Madrigan in 2003, when the, the governments again came together and, and civil society and said, this it has to be formalized. This is when we're gonna establish an office at the UN on sport for development and peace. This is when um, we're gonna have you know, a clear understanding of not only what it is, but how we're gonna monitor the impacts that it has. Um, so I had an opportunity to engage in those conversations on behalf of IPC with the IPC president and CEO, but then also it was, it was a great opportunity for us to bring it into the Paralympic movement. And so in fact, the opening, the day of the opening ceremony of the Athens games, the day before the opening ceremony, of the Torino games, we held international conferences and dialogues on human rights and sport for development. And the sole purpose was to show that the Paralympic movement wanted to be part of this bigger discussion, but also had a major role to play. And that sport for people with disabilities was grounded in human rights and in sport for development. And so we made major headway early on in the mid 2000s to say, IPC is no longer just games and just sport. We're here and we're gonna be part of the UN um, system and we're gonna advocate for the rights of all people with disabilities, not just our athletes, but we're gonna use the platform of the games to do that. And so if there's time, David, um, two other specific examples. Um, while I was there, we also started our first organizational development initiative, a grant scheme to look at where were the inequalities in funding and in support? And how could we make sure that the resources were not just going to the most developed National Paralympic Committees in the more developed nations? Um, and we brought in a lot of partners. We brought in UK Sport, Commonwealth Games Canada, and we got this system set up 
And many of you, if you know the Paralympic Committee of Rwanda today, for example, and their leadership, you know, they were one of the first countries to enter that program. And now 15 years later, they're some of the leaders in Africa and globally. And so we really try to look at leaving no one behind, really in the sense of Paralympic sport. And the other example I'll give is that um, as an outcome of a horrible incident, which was the tsunami that hit um, the Indian Ocean and specifically Sri Lanka. In 2004, I went over there with some money from a donor to try and develop and use the sport to get the morale up. And the best outcome of this whole trip was the relationship that was built and the vision that I was able to get people on board for, which was to create low cost sport wheelchairs, flat pack, low cost sport wheelchairs and Motivation UK, that organization is already doing it in everyday, sport, everyday wheelchairs. And so we brought on tennis, we brought on wheelchair basketball, and today they still exist. They're flourishing. They have the, um, uh, the racing chair, the multi-sport chair, but just to say that, you know, these little impetuses to say, how are we going to help the countries and the Paralympic committees and the athletes who need a little boost? And then the, 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 the ripple effect can be just so amazing, right? So now even in the US, we're using these motivation wheelchairs because they are what we all need to engage and to be part of the movement and to access our right to sport as people with disabilities. So in closing, I'll just say, I think that there's been a realization way back into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and even prior that there was a direct connection to human rights and a direct connection to sport for development. But it was really, as far as my time there, I saw that in the early 2000s, we were able to formalize a few pieces which have launched us into where we are today. Um, and I'm happy to say, you know, that I think We the 15 campaign, which I hope Juan Pablo will touch on, is actually, you know, that's how, where we are today. And that's because of all of the things that we've done until now. So thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you, Amy. And I just a, a quick note, I know that you made reference to the Commonwealth Games in Canada. And I can see that there are some speak, some people joining us today actually representing that organization. Uh, so welcome to them. And I would like to come back uh, towards the end to talk about things like the, the SDGs, the UN's SDGs and the convention. And, you know, again, 20 years from, from when it was initi initiated, what has been the impact? How can it uh, perhaps provide impact moving forward? I also just want to acknowledge that I'm seeing the questions coming up in the chat function, but we'll get to those um, once our, our three speakers are done. And we, again, we have an hour and a half for this, se this seminar, so we do have time for those conversations to take place once our three speakers are done. But thank you for the questions that are coming in. Um, certainly appreciate those getting initiated. So Jenny, now over to you, who had a similar role to Amy at the IPC, but I don't think there was ever a time where the two of you crossed over. I don't think you worked together, um, but I could be wrong about that. So Jenny, over to you. Welcome. Uh, Jenny is joining us this morning from London, England. Well, thank you, David and Eli and um, Dr. Stedward. Um, it's really fantastic to be here, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity um, to be to to speak today. Um, yeah, so I guess just to start off, Amy and I actually have never met. Um, but it, we did have a couple of phone calls, and um, yeah, I can see, especially from the example she's mentioned, that there was a lot of um, sort of pick up from where she left off at IPC in, in terms of the seven years that I spent at IPC. Um, so I'll start, I guess, just introducing myself briefly, um, and then I'll pick up on her examples because I think that actually will um, flow quite nicely. So I'm originally from Canada and um, yeah, great to see our Commonwealth Games, uh, Canadian Commonwealth Games colleagues there because that's actually where I first got into sport for development. I spent two years in Trinidad and Tobago, um, and that's actually where I got uh, involved in the Paralympic Committee because the NGO I was working for, which was um, part of Commonwealth Games program, um, was really interested in helping to develop a national Paralympic Committee in, in that country um, because they, I think they felt that there could be a, a longer term pathway for development and also help to advocate for the rights of people with disabilities within, within the country. Um, so 
So I played a role in setting up that committee and it was really quite cool to, to um, see them win their first gold medal in Rio and have their first athlete compete in the Commonwealth Games in, in, in India, in Delhi and also in London. Um, so that's really kind of a big fuel to my, um, my career I've made so far, I guess, within the Paralympic movement. Um, so I think the examples that I'll touch on now will be sort of from my time at ICSBI. So I worked in Berlin with the with ICSBI um, on the MINEPS 5 conference, which is in UNESCO Sport Ministers Conference. Um, I'll touch on the seven years I spent with IPC in their foundation called the Aikidos Foundation, and then um, my current role, which is at Loughborough University. Um, so I guess picking up where Amy left off. Uh, Jenny, Jenny, just yeah. as, as you do those things. So XP, for instance, if you could, you know, describe a little bit of what XP is, because some people may not know what the acronym is. So just as long as we're, um, when you go through those, because that's exactly what I wanted you to do. Um, and when you're even talking about your role with Loughborough, if you can just explain a little bit of kind of what's going on um, with your job there, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, of course. No problem. Um, so... ICSPI, International Council for Sports Science and Physical Education. Took a little while to get my, uh, my tongue around that. Um, but when I was there, they played a very integral role in um, supporting sort of the secretariat for the MINEPS 5 conference. So MINEPS 5 is the World Sport Ministers Conference. It hadn't happened for quite some number of years um, before it was hosted in Berlin in 2015. And this was really the opportunity to relook at sort of the global guidance for sports policy. Um, so it would bring together all member states as well as scientific organizations, sport movement um, and NGOs involved in this space uh, to really review, um, review sport policy in general. Um, and one of the main themes was on um, inclusion of women and girls and people with disabilities. And I, I think one of the, the main, um, I guess one of the main things that were tying Amy's work with the UN, um, the CRPD um, was now this work to get the wording right within um, the ministerial dec declaration, which would kind of frame sport policy globally for the next years. And that also built the foundation for what we all know now is the Kazan Action Plan. So very similar structure was um, used to formulate that document. Um, so I think there's a big sort of a big carryover and there are a lot of organizations um, within the Paralympic movement, but also Special Olympics um, and Deaf Olympics were all really involved in, in getting this wording right and um, yeah, starting to, to advocate. I'm just gonna jump forward to something quickly and then I'll go back again, but um, that uh, that's, the importance of that that documentation was really evident to a few meetings I was involved in before Christmas, which was in, which was the African the review of the African Union sport policy document. And as sort of reviewing that space, um, the wording that was within the Kazan Action Plan and the CRPD really sort of forms that foundation and makes sure that um, there is that level of inclusion. Um, within the African sport system and hopefully starting to filter down a little bit more um, with, at the national level, for example. Um, so that's that's sort of one area I was involved in in 2015. Then I spent a number of years at the IPC and um, I think Amy mentioned the organizational development in initiative. And when I came into the, the IPC, we started using that program as a, as a basis to expand into what we now know as the organizational capacity program. Um, and that was also working with um, national Paralympic committees around the world to help focus on three areas, marketing and communication, as well as their sport, developing their, their athletes um, and um, <coughs> looking at governance as well. So those were sort of the three core areas. And it started off relatively small because there wasn't that much funding. Um, but in 2016, there was a huge uh, partnership deal signed with Toyota. And I think that really has had an amazing impact 
on the National Paralympic Committees around the world, especially those in Africa and Latin America and um, in, in Oceania and Asia, um, because it's really helped to provide more consistent programming, more consistent funding. Um, so that allowed the organizational capacity program to be delivered to over 140 countries um, and also allowed um, for grants for equipment and um, the ability to start other, other types of programs to focus on athlete development, for example, um, grant competition grants um, and athlete development programs where there were coaches brought in to build capacity um, in other regions. So that grant, that partnership with Toyota really re revolutionized um, the way the IPC was able to support um, its, its national Paralympic committees and sort of provide more consistent support, I think, over those years. And it, it's, it's great that the program, it's now, what, 2022, and that program is due to end in 2024. So it's also pretty cool to have eight years of consistent funding, which for those working in sport for development and in the development sector is relatively unheard of at times. It's always kind of small grants um, and you're usually kind of scrambling to, to see where the next money is coming from. Um, so I think that really allowed the IPC to have some consistency and advocate for um, more funding around that. Um, David, if it's all right, I might skip over to what I'm working on now because um, it does build a little bit on, on the capacity building work that I was working on within the IPC. Um, but this new project that I've uh, spent the last two years on with Lovebro University is collaborating with the, the IPC, um, three national Paralympic committees in Africa. So in Malawi, Ghana, and Zambia. Um, and it's funded by UK aid. Um, sort of under this umbrella relating to assistive technology, which again relates into what Amy was saying about um, lower, lower cost wheelchairs and, and really using sport as a platform to, um, to advocate for technology as a human right. Um, so this, this project is quite complex, but basically it's taking, um, we took the Tokyo 2020 broadcast coverage to 49 countries in Africa for the first time. And it was a sort of a test to see how, um, what the reception was about watching Parasport on terrestrial TV um, and how we could start to make an impact um, in terms of investment and in terms of advocating for the, the way people think about disability um, and what people with disabilities can do. Uh, and I guess one of the grounding features was not just saying, hey, this is how we do it in the UK, or this is how we do it in Canada, and this is the way it has to be done. Um, but there's a significant amount of research um, brought in by Lovebro University and also the University of Malawi um, and the University of Ghana to try to uh, see how Paralympics could be broadcast within the cultural context. Um, and local understanding of disability. Uh, and I think that it has been absolutely fascinating and I'm waiting for the research team to uh, put together some of their findings. Um, so we'll be able to, to talk a bit more about um, how that has really sort of, uh, what are the main lessons learned and, and how we can start building towards coverage for um, Paris 2024. So I'm conscious I covered a whole lot. Um, things from uh, the port sport policy aspect um, to a light touch on sort of capacity building programs within the IPC, and then now to this sort of broadcast coverage awareness, um, cultural side of things with the current project I'm on. Um, but I think I'll, I'll pause there and I'm sure there'll be some questions uh, to come later on. So, well, and I think there's going to be an opportunity. I've been looking at some of the questions to connect back, particularly with this most recent project that you're talking about and broadcasting the games. And so this idea of broadcasting Paralympic athletes, and does that lead to benefits for people with experiencing disability outside of sport? 
And, you know, I think in, in an African context will be an interesting uh, conversation for us to have a little bit later. But before we do that, and thank you, Jenny, and it's nice to see you again. Um, we'll go to Juan Pablo, who's now again joining us with a new job. Thank you. And I didn't realize you had a new job and you're taking time out to do this with us. So you're joining us from Buenos Aires, Argentina, and you're uh, originally from Colombia. And you and I got to know each other and connect through wheelchair rugby many, many, many moons ago um, when I was an official with, with uh, quad rugby, wheelchair rugby, murder ball um, from my Canadian earliest days. So Juan Pablo, thank you for joining us this morning and over to you. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, I truly miss those uh, wheelchair rugby days um, a few lives ago, as you mentioned. So uh, it's such an honor to be with you guys this morning. Um, and it was so great to hear uh, Bob said we talk about that genesis and you know that evolution uh, of the of the movement. Uh, while he was talking, I was like thinking, geez, like through this story, you can see this, the evolution of the human rights movement of these people with disabilities in itself. Uh, he mentions that uh, these first games back in Stock Mandeville, but later even, uh, were a rehabilitation strategy. We were not talking about elite athletes, we were talking about patients. They were people that were, you know, just acquired a disability, didn't know how to, you know, live their lives with a disability. And through sports, they got some health uh, benefits. But from that to having games that are, you know, elite and competitive, and, you know, we have countries competing for the gold and the glory, uh, decades have to had to go along and you can see how this kind of parallels the shift from the medical uh, model of disability to the human rights model of disabilities we're no longer patients suddenly we became citizens with human rights and that shift is very important and i think it's marked among many other things, but the before and after when history is going to judge us is going to be the CRPD, the UN Convention on the Rights uh, of People with Disabilities. It's there where the world says, okay, these guys are not sick. They are uh, subjects of human rights in total capacity to go and claim those human rights. So you see the parallel uh, even from the structure of the, of the Paralympic sports. No longer it's important to be blind or in a wheelchair um, or have an intellectual disability, but what sport do you do? So the whole structure of federations from disabilities to sports started shifting, uh, but we're still in that transition. I mean, uh, uh, Bob and Philip did a, an amazing work in advancing the movement. Um, and now Andrew is like taking this baton and taking it to the, to the next level, but we're still in the genesis. I mean, we're still on the edge of on, on passing culturally from one paradigm to the other. Now, having said that, I can tell you a bit, a bit about my work because and about my stress and anxiety and why I can't sleep at night, David. And it's because I have two hats and uh, one hat is from the human rights world, meaning I've worked in disability public policy, uh, you know, lawyers with lawyers. I was, I worked in government uh, and I worked in multilateral organizations like the Organization of American States. And now I'm in the multilateral uh, development bank world. I, I worked at, uh, at the IDB, which is uh, based in Washington DC. And now I'm in, uh, CAF, which is another development bank, helping countries in the Americas region implement the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. So that's one language. My other hat has been my passion. You know, I started with you on rugby so many lives ago, and I loved it. And I that got me in the loop. So they invited me to, to be chef the mission for Beijing and London Games. Then I was president of the Colombian Paralympic Committee. Then I went to IPC. Uh, and these people speak an entirely different language. You know, the sports for people with disability language. The, the people are different, the, the assembly is, is different. Their objectives, lingo, and even understanding of their own reality 
is very different. So when you speak both languages and you see that these people are not understanding each other, that's a stress and anxiety, you know, because uh, living in both when you when you're in the human rights world, you know, you're, you're always saying like, why are we not using sports more in our world to move human rights? And when I was, you know, in an IPC and in that jungle, I would say, guys, why are you not, cons not considering human rights as a priority? And why are you not working with this more? Because David, it's not only two different languages, but they have a common sin. And it's that both preach to the choir. You know, the, the CRPD nerds speak to other CRPD nerds and the IPC nerds speak only within themselves also. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a big, um, that's a big problem because of course these two worlds complement each other and would both benefit a lot of collaborating uh, more. But we're getting there, you know, from both sides there, there's like, you know, interest in bridging that gap because for years i would also argue that there was even mistrust between the those movements you know the president of the national council of disability of a country is not necessarily bff with the president of the paralympic committee of that same country you know because they will compete maybe for budget uh they will they will distrust each other this is going to be common um, in many in many places in the world in the world, so if we get to bridge that internationally, maybe it can start landing uh, locally in different uh, in different countries and in different regions. Now, to be fair, uh, this is not a problem particular to disability rights or to disability sports. It's a problem in general. You know the the uh, SDG UN world. And the sport and the sports world are not necessarily aligned until a few years ago in 2017 that unesco came about with a document called the kazan action plan so let's give a little bit of context on that unesco is the un agency that leads the global debate and framework on sports and they have a general assembly called mineps which is like a un uh, role play, you know, all the countries in the world, but the guys that are sit sitting down on the table are the ministers of sport of all countries. So they um, went together in 2017 to, of all places, Russia, Kazan, and in Russia, Kazan, they came about with a declaration that said, you know, guys, you know what? It's time that the world takes seriously the impact on, of sports in human rights and in development. So this Kazan Action Plan aims at understanding and measuring the causality of sports on SDGs. Now, this is very recent. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like five years is a lot of time. Well, it's not when it comes to, you know, uh, landing that uh, wishy, that great wish and dream of, of tracing that causality, bringing it down to real hard uh, indicators, methodologies, and frameworks that you can actually go to a country, unpack and use, that's gonna take us a while. So we're not there. The world is not there. The world of people with disabilities is a little bit even uh, further. But I know that UNESCO and IPC are working because you know, in my previous life in IPC, I, I was helping to actually land this agenda so that IPC could tackle the little chapter of that Kazan Action Plan of the, you know, that wider global initiative to measure the impact of sports on human rights on the disability world. So we're getting there. And where do we want to get, David? It's make, mainly two aspects. So first of all, we need to understand that uh, access of people with disabilities to their human right to sport. You know, sport in itself is a human right enshrined in the UN Convention of People with Disabilities. And every country needs to provide access to people with disabilities, either through, you know, accessibility in the sports venues, equal comp compensation to 
athletes uh, with and without disabilities that represent uh, the countries, equal budgets for, you know, uh, coaches, trainers, venues, traveling, competition, and so on uh, and so forth, but also, you know, safeguarding for uh, women and girls um, in, uh, in sports. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that the world still needs to do to provide access for people with disabilities to their human rights to sports. So that's one way to see it. When we achieve that, we can work on understanding how sport in itself is a tool for, for change. If we say that, because we kind of, it feels good to say, no, but can we measure it? We, we'll love to say, no, sport, sports Paralympic Games are the most powerful tool for tro social transformation. Yes, well, how much? How many Paralympic Games does a society uh, that doesn't include people with disabilities need to see in order for them to uh, include people with disabilities? You know, can we properly measure that? Um, it's not that simple. Again, we all hope so, but in the metrics of how many Muhammad Ali's make one Martin Luther King, you know, the, the science to, to actually prove that theorem is, is not available yet. Uh, we're getting there as a community, as humanity. Uh, I know IPC has advanced uh, in this, uh, but also the Civil Society of People with Disabilities and Disability Rights NGOs uh, are working towards this. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're in the genesis of these frameworks, but we're still far from um, making it happen. We did 15 was an advancement uh, in this direction, but more on the communication side of this direction. You know, we did 15 is a great campaign. Um, and campaigns uh, for awareness of this possibility are very important, but a bit dangerous uh, because awareness for our awareness sake uh, can get uh, these organizations in the trouble of, okay, so you're, you're talking the talk, but are you walking it? You know, are you actually doing the technical work uh, behind the beautiful campaign to make sure that you're actually accounting and facilitating the advancement of the rights of people with disabilities through sports. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, maybe, maybe I shoot it back to you, David. This is kind of how, how I see the problem we are, we are in. So back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much to our three speakers. Um, I'm going to try and tie in some of the questions that I've seen coming in the chat function. This, this, this is the tough part for me. So we've talked about the Kazan Action Plan for 2017, and I, I think the minutes next meeting is this June. Um, it's scheduled for this June, and I think ba Baku, Azerbaijan, I think is where it's being planned to be held. At That's right. Prison. Um, the CRPD is, is going to be hosting its meetings at the UN in New York City, I think actually the week after. Um, so these continue to move forward. The We the 15 campaign, which launched in uh, during the Tokyo Paralympic Games just this past August, is really you know in its earliest stages of its evolution. And so you've talked, and 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 Juan Pablo, you mentioned in particular, you know, the Kazan Action Plan, although it's almost five years old, but that's still in its relative infancy. And if you know, we go back to Dr. Stedward's comments about the Paralympic movement, and Juan Pablo, I think you reiterated this, again, is still relatively new. Um, you know, some of this, all of this has happened within some of our own, our own lifetimes. And so it's, you know, in some cases, just one generation still where a lot of this has taken place. So what I'm wanting us to talk a little bit about now, and so Amy, Jenny, and Juan Pablo, if I can get you to think about this, is, and, and Juan Pablo, it was, it was your comment that kind of spurred me on to ask this question. So we've got these action plans, we've got these campaigns, we have these initiatives, but what, what, is, what needs to happen in order for real change to take place for the person experiencing disability? And maybe, maybe that's a very different, maybe that's an almost impossible question to answer, but what, what do you, in your opinion, do you think needs to take place in order to take it from an action plan, a convention, a guideline 
to actual change at the community level. Um, and I'll open that up to, to any of the three of you. And then I'm gonna go back to the questions and see if I can pull out some of the different questions here and, and bring them into our conversation. And Eli, I would ask you to, to certainly participate in this process too. So Jen, Jenny, Jenny and Pablo, and I know, I know this, is a, this is a tough question to answer. I mean, this is, this is likely what people spend their entire careers trying to figure out. So it's not an easy question to answer, but I'm wanting to, if we can maybe start there. Well, I, I'd say that the reason we call it movement it's because it's a network of different organizations that have different roles, different responsibilities that help move it forward. Um, but I would say like the continuum is you have grassroots organizations, uh, you know, uh, making trouble for their human rights, claiming their human rights, uh, saying, hey, this needs to change, doing the advocacy, so that's one. Two, you have public policy. You know, you need uh, the Greta Thunbergs, but then you need the guys inside the conference room that can actually pass bills and assign uh, budgets and implement that public policy. And then you have popular culture to translate that public policy of that difficult lawyery lingo into <laughs> into language that everyone, every kid with a disability can own and understand and replicate. And that's the role of sports. You know, sports as a manifestation of, of popular uh, culture. But sports, in a way, it's also a grassroots organization because, you know, what are national Paralympic committees and clubs, if not organizations of people with disabilities? So it lands on their plate again, and then they will claim that it's what the public policy and the implementation of the public policy is not enough. We need more budget, we need more blah, blah, blah. So they will take it back to more public policy, more action plans that governments uh, can implement. The, the governments will do so. And then you have, again, the manifestation of, of that with through popular culture and you know through media and having you know private companies uh, use sport and uh, people with disabilities in their ads to shift the culture. And that's the, the continuum. So grassroots, public policy, popular culture. And I, and I would argue from a Canadian context, the number of commercials that now include persons experiencing disability and whether or not that's an impact of We the 15, the Paralympic movement, or if that's just an equity, diversity, inclusion movement that's having that impact. But it's significant regardless, um, particularly as it's leading up to the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. Um, the numbers of commercials that included athletes experiencing disability was a dramatic change um, mm. from many games previous. Jenny and Amy, I want you to, to feel free to, to chime in on this. Yeah, I think, Are yeah. you able to? Oh, good. Thanks. I think from, from my perspective, what I would add to um, Juan Pablo's is I guess the future generation um, and the importance of education um, and being within uh, school systems and having that sort of exposure and um, I guess a chance to to see and feel and, and talk about um, inclusion, uh, all topics of EDI, including disability, um, because I think sometimes disability gets lost in the EDI conversation. And I, I saw that, especially within um, the university spheres. Sometimes it's just that it's, it's not as uh, prominent as it should be. Um, and I think it's really important um, for the future generations, like my son, who's three in his nursery, they had a little Paralympic day um, during uh, the Tokyo Games, which I think has a, has a huge impact. You come home talking about um, different elements of, of sport and um, disability inclusion. Um, to also being at the university level and, and what are we teaching um, the, the next generation that's going into the workplace um, who are educating our next generation and being involved in the medical system, for example, how are, how are they being exposed um, and, and communicating and speaking about disability inclusion. Um, so that, I guess, for me, that's, that's what I would add to, um, to Juan, Juan Pablo's three. Thank you, Jenny. Amy, was there anything further you wanted to add to that conversation? No, I mean, I think they both covered it really well. I would just say, I think we're at a really good time 
in our history where we're uh, talking about a lot of issues on inclusion, leaving no one behind and diversity, equity and inclusion. So I think now is a prime time to bring all those partners together as Juan Pablo outlined. Um, and it's kind of like when you look at, you know, what is disability, it's the interaction between the individual and the environment. And that's really what it's gonna take to move this along, to have more, less stigma, less discrimination and more inclusion. It's really gonna be a marrying of the two. So all the different components that Juan Pablo mentioned. And I think the reason we're seeing more and more inclusion of people with disabilities in mainstream communications, the example you gave and other examples in policy development is because we are reflecting more as a society globally. And I think that's to our advantage. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there's an example that's taking place right now. I saw that there was a comment um, from someone in the Philippines who's talked, who I think we're speaking now to a, a sports science class. Um, and their question was about you know, how sports help people with disabilities, which is incumbent in this conversation. And so the fact that a class is listening to this conversation in the Philippines, I think is a good example, you know, Jenny, of, of kind of, extenuate, of, of extending what you were talking about with your, with your three-year-old child having you know, the Paralympic day in their, in their preschool. Um, Can I actually just do a quick follow-up? Yeah, please. Then on, uh, I just want, I was curious, because you've talked about the movement and one question occurs to me is also about allies. And allyship, and do you feel like we're the disability and sport movement is gaining traction with allies so that it's not always a disability communication, but it's more, you know, gender and race and sex, you know, are we seeing that? Do we feel like that's powerful? Is that use, you know, I guess just briefly on that, I just wanted to make sure I got that onto the conversation. Anyone want to chime in on that? Point. Do you, I'm just curious what you feel if, if that's happening now more or not. A little bit, yes. Uh, I would say that, um, well, IPC has committees, for example, of women in, in sports. So those committees would network with, I don't know, UN women or other uh, civil society organizations that maybe have nothing to do with disabilities, but are more feminist organizations. Uh, so, so that's um, that's an example. But yeah, allies. I mean, I think David also touched on this with the example of the of the Canadians private companies becoming allies of the cause of people with disabilities by including uh, persons with disabilities in their communications. Um, which is, which is great, especially when it's a win-win alliance, you know, when they do it um, out of, you know, historic responsibility and uh, uh, adherence to the cause, but also because they will sell more sodas or whatever the, the company was trying to sell with the, with the ad. So, so yeah, I think uh, alliances with other movements and with uh, other, types of organizations that are not necessarily uh, disability, um, about disability, I think that is, that is fundamental. But, but again, I think we need to figure out a way to, to give them value in, yeah. in, in the Alliance. Yeah. Jenny or Amy, did you wanna comment on that? I guess I'll just say that I'll add that, you know, intersectionality is a really big thing right now. So for example, um, I work with the UN on disability inclusion in all of the 131 country teams. And right now, when we talk about disability, it never comes alone. It's always coming with gender. It's always coming with youth. It's always coming with indigenous um, peoples. It's always coming together with these other major marginalized groups and other topics. And so I think sport is, is going to follow suit. I do think that we have to look at the intersectionality across everything we do in Paralympic sport. And I think the movement is going to follow suit. Well, and I think the example that was just posted in our chat function, I think it's Chukpa, if I'm pronouncing that properly, um, is, is, a, is a great example of that, uh, where you're getting that intersectionality of different disabilities, genders, et cetera. Jenny, before I move on to another question, I just wanna make sure that you had a chance to provide anything too. Yeah, I know. I, I think it's been well covered. Um, I think in my experience being involved in different sort of women in sport um, groups outside of, of disability, you're, we're starting to see over the years that there's much more uh, diversity within within those groups, um, which is really positive. 
Um, and I think we're also seeing, and I'd always advocate for uh, the inclusion of not just the, um, what will I say, more developed countries, um, but also really making sure that the diversity includes voices from yeah. um, a variety of different regions and a variety of different incomes in countries. Um, because I think as, as we found the, those voices are just critical in making sure that um, what we're advocating for at the country context makes sense for the culture and country um, and the people that, that live there. Um, so yeah, I would, I would just add that as a next. Mm. No, I think that's an excellent point. Actually, that was gonna be one of the places that I wanted to talk a little bit about, because I've noticed there are some questions about that, but I'm gonna, I'll come back to that point, but because there's been a couple of other questions of, I don't wanna say the disconnect, but perhaps a criticism of using the Paralympic movement and high performance sport to advocate on behalf of persons with a disability in more of a human rights perspective. But yet the argument I think is that many people with that experience disability don't necessarily connect themselves with high performance athletes with a disability. And yet we're trying to use Paralympic sport. And I think you saw a little bit of this with the We the 15 campaign in that it tried to move away from that and to ensure that it was showing regular, quote unquote, regular persons with disability in the day-to-day -day experiences and not just the gold medalists. And, but there's, there's pushback to that too. And so I guess what I'm looking for is the use of high performance sport for the purposes of promoting a sport for development agenda and whether you think that that is a good thing, um, whether it should be altered, changed, uh, are the criticisms warranted, uh, et cetera. And again, I'll open that up to the, to the three of you. Juan Pablo, I could just see, I could just tell by the look on your face that you wanted to take a, take a, a shot at this, but I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, it's fine. I, I think that Paralympic sports have become a product of mass consumption. Uh, meaning you will get crowds of people that don't have disabilities whatsoever in or around their lives that are going to see that they're going to want to consume that product um, versus another. I mean, this, this has been, become a, a, a horse in the race for people's attention uh, with entertainment. So can you go and watch uh, movies? Or, or are you going to go, uh, I don't know, to, or are you going to watch Paralympic sports? We are competing for people's um, attention. So I do think that for mass consumption, you need the elite. You know, you need uh, good, competen good competitions of, um, you know, competitive uh, athletes. You need to make it fun. Um, this doesn't mean that sports for people with disabilities is only elite sports for people with disabilities. Uh, you need sports as recreation, sports in the, um, in the, for, for rehabilitation even, uh, sports in the grassroots levels. Uh, the pinnacle of that goes to, to Paralympic or elite uh, competition as with anything. You know, you, 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 is it fair to all tennis players that only a hundred of them compete internationally and only 10 or 20 of them go to, you know, Grand Slam competitions? Well, it, 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 elite sports is exclusive by definition. You know, it excludes because only the best, only the, the top of the pyramid will will qualify and that is what makes it an object of admiration, hence consumption for the masses. Is it good for Sunday uh, amateur tennis players that the Wimbledon exists? Yes, you know, it gets more people involved, uh, it gets lower around it, it gets media coverage, it gives people inspiration and motivation to, to, to continue with their hobby in their hobby uh, level. If a certain country is only investing in elite sports, it's only investing in the three kids with disabilities that are making good marks and that can qualify to a Paralympic Games, 
that's a problem. But that's not normally the case. You know, in most countries that have that take this seriously, and this includes many countries of the global south, they have a pool of amateur or young athletes <clears throat> that are not competing for the you know gold and glory of the games, and it's thanks to that broader pool of amateur sports that you eventually can train people and make them climb up that ladder of of the competence to become elite athletes. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Amy or Jenny, did you want to respond to that? that Can I come in and just say, I mean, we see this with all elite athletes, you know, they have a platform and that platform can be used for a variety of purposes and messages. And you see it with Ukraine right now. You see it with, um, you know, I look at human rights and sports broadly. And so I don't think we should discredit the fact that some people who have made the elite level use that to advocate for rights and changes. Um, I think that's only part of a broader uh, um, system wide approach. So I, I do think that um, there has to be grassroots, there has to be um, all the levels, you need to invest in all of it. But um, I think it's still important for people with a platform to use it to advance the rights. Okay. And I think from my perspective, I'd just jump in and say, um, I think it's been a really interesting shift and in especially being involved in this broadcasting project in Africa. Um, how the sort of packaging around Parasport has shifted um, mainly from 2012 um, onwards and how we're looking not just at sort of these backstories of athletes and saying, oh, poor, poor person um, who has a disability would get totally moved away from that. And it's now um, much more focused on the support the sport, the performance of that athlete and what they're doing on the field um, of play and not necessarily sort of this, this backstory um, uh, on this sort of poor, poor me perspective or poor person perspective, but now it's more showcasing what that person can do on the field of play and what they can do in, in life in general. And I think that is how um, We the 15 has come in 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 the lead up to Tokyo and end in Tokyo to really give more of a platform to say people with a disability have jobs like you and I have a family go through the same struggles of, of uh, breakups and love and romance and all those things. And um, that's sort of this platform for this human rights discussion, um, which yeah, is, is, is balancing on this, um, the, the sport platform at the moment. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the point that I wanted to, to bring in there. Okay. Eli, I wanted to pass it back to you to ask a, a quick question. And Dr. Sedder, again, you always get the final word. So I just want to make sure that I, I prep you for that because um, we've got about 15 minutes left in our time. So Eli, over to you. I know we're receiving a lot of you know great comments and questions and great you know, really learning a lot through this conversation as well, um, which is amazing. Um, but I did just want to talk a little bit about kind of the ad. You talked a little bit about advocacy and kind of raising awareness and bringing disability forward um, in creative way. You know, different strategies, different approaches, whether that's through um, you know music or songs or art or you know just different types of ways of raising awareness of uh, disability inclusion. I guess to parallel it with what we're seeing with women in sport, you know, we've seen the equal pay, we're seeing a lot historically, the movement of women in sport, of that progress. And I guess I would just love to hear your thoughts on, you know, with disability inclusion in, in sport and recreation, you know, are, are we doing it right? You know, what else could we be doing? Different ways of raising our voices um, in all different ways. I just, just thought I'd uh, follow up with that question for any comments you'd like to share on sort of the advocacy movement in, in different ways that we're seeing it. Eli, I, I would say that like in the different manifestations of popular culture, as you say, music, uh, uh, movies, uh, and so on and so forth, it, it's important 
to bring the creatives on board um, through mainstreaming the, the, you know, giving them basic literacy on disability rights. Uh, because awareness, for awareness sake, can be very dangerous and awareness poorly done can be very dangerous as well. Uh, meaning a well-intended intended creative that wants to include a character with a disability in the next Hollywood movie may end up uh, portraying that uh, disability in a stereotypical way that not only not adds to the shift in the world that we want to see, but subtracts. Because at the end, women, gender issues, LGBTQ, uh, racial or and disabilities, we are all aiming at shifting cultures to make them more um, inclusive for all of these uh, communities. But given that this culture is a social construct, it can evolve and it can devolve. You know, we can we can do two steps forward and one step back, and and that's what can happen. So I think that the, what the disability crowd can do is try to simplify that uh, language and make it easy and fun on how to, to instruct these creative types and the, the, the creative um, individuals to properly portray people with disabilities uh, without falling into stereotypes. What are those? Well, you know, the super, super crip, you know, people with disabilities that despite, quote unquote, despite their disability, like compensate with some type of uh, superpower. Second, the villain, you know, like Richard III or Darth Vader, that their disability is such a painful thing that it made them want to revenge against the world because of their disability and they become uh, villains. You get the innocent fool, you know, the Forrest Gumps of the world, people with disabilities that are eternal children, don't have any other dimensions to their existence, just, you know, the beauty and angelical beauty of uh, having a, a disability. Um, and uh, the victim, which is, you know, the million dollar baby and uh, examples like that, that portray characters with disabilities, which their whole purpose and their whole existence is only around the drama uh, of the disabilities. So those are like four that I can name out of memory, um, but there's a lot of literature and, and interesting stuff to read on how to go about portraying people with disabilities proper, properly in, in the media. And we that are, you know, the advocates of the movement should should have that informa information readily available for anyone that you know the, the guy in your company that is doing the website and wants to include people with disabilities throw him a link throw him or her a link where they know how to do this properly that, that that's a really interesting point if i just may chime in before jenny and amy do we talked about the commercials leading up to the Olympic and Paralympic Games here in Canada and having more individuals with disabilities on the commercials. But I just saw a report in the last couple of days that came out from the United States showing that the percentage of individuals with disabilities on kind of broadcast television shows has actually decreased in the last year. And now it didn't, it was around 4%, I think, two years ago, and it's gone down to around 3%. So it's not a dramatic change, but it's a decrease as opposed to an increase, which you might have expected or anticipated. And so I think it's something to, to not kind of rest our laurels on and anticipate that it's just going to continue to increase and increase. I think it's an important thing to kind of, kind of bear in mind. Anyways, Amy and Jenny, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, Maybe I think I can, just, oh, go ahead, Amy. I was just going to piggyback on the U.S. comment, <laughs> being from the United States, and say when the bar is so low, I, I just think, you know, we have such, we're doing so poorly in disability representation in our mainstream communications, 4% or 2% are both horrible. So let's, let's acknowledge that and say whether it goes up or down, we are <laughs> horrific. We are one of the countries that has the least coverage of the Paralympic Games, and this has been decades long. Um, so just parking that for a moment, I'll make one quick comment. And that is, I think one area where more work can be done, which might create change 
is around the organization, um, self-organization of the athletes to get a stronger and more unified and louder voice. Um, since I don't work for the IPC right now, I can say this, to really approach the IPC with some real serious requests. You know, I think the IPC has to be held accountable and I think the athletes could do slightly better at, at coming together and joining and with, ally, with allies or with their platform. But um, I just see pockets of that. I don't really see a mass movement. And I think we've learned that from the disability rights movement, right? Like when OPD organizations of persons with disabilities get stronger, um, and their voice is louder. It's the same with the black rights movements and others like women's rights you were talking about. Like we just, we kind of lack in that I feel. And that would be one area I think improvements could be had. Over to you, Jenny, and sorry for cutting you off. No, no, that was fine. It was, uh, I think your point linked a lot of them, a lot cleaner than mine did. Um, so I guess what I was gonna bring in was sort of from the representation side of things. and. Um, looking sort of at communication and how we frame disability. I think the research that we're doing now um, in Sub-Saharan Africa is, is quite, um, I think will be quite important, I guess, for the, the next steps in um, looking at sort of this concept of communication for development, which I guess kind of parallels sport for development. Um, and there's different sort of theories behind how you would use communication to, to advocate for change in society. Um, and some of the tools used in Sub-Saharan Africa around theater, theater for development or radio dramas, which are probably much, well, definitely a much more prominent um, way of communicating there versus um, um, here and how characters of disability are, are represented within those cultures um, and how, if there is a shift. Um, and I think one of the things they're doing now is looking to see if we can bring in Paralympic characters and what they would look like um, within that, that context. So I think it will all be quite fascinating to see um, and sort of watch over the next um, summer Paralympic games on how, how those things shift. But it is, yeah, it is, it, the, the framing of the media and pop culture plays such a huge role um, in talking outside the disability community um, and the sport community. Um, and I think that is, is gonna be the way that we're gonna have to focus um, going forward to make that impact. I wanna make sure that I give appropriate time to Dr. Sedward for his final kind of comments and thoughts. So Manish, we may not get to your question, I apologize. Brian McPherson, I saw that your question earlier about the, you know, the, the resource intensity for sport for development. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to your question either. And for those of you who also, I, I didn't get a chance to sp speak specific to your questions. I apologize and Mary, I acknowledge your comment too about you know the number of actors with disabilities that are out there that should be on television. So thank you, thank you for that. So Dr. Sedward, again, I, I wanna make sure that we give you an ample opportunity here to kind of provide some uh, summative thoughts and comments you know, in your role as founding president of the International Paralympic Committee and having been involved in sport for disability uh, for decades prior to that as well. And recognizing, again, the, the purpose of these talks is to look at the history of a particular aspect to the Paralympic movement to help us understand kind of our current situation and then moving forward um, in dealing with issues such as, Amy, you, you recognize that your thoughts are with what's happening in Ukraine right now and how perhaps, you know, a Paralympic movement and sport for persons experiencing disability can provide opportunities in a variety of contexts on a global global scale. So Dr. Stedward, over to you for some final concluding comments. Oh, you're on mute, Dr. Stedward. All I can say right now is wow. This was uh, such a interesting and inspiring session uh, today. And my old mind uh, doesn't remember very much very often, but I can tell you my mind is spinning right now because I have so many questions I'd love to ask. And, and there's so much work we have to do, uh, you know, in the whole area of human rights and the impact that sport uh, at the grassroots or at the elite level uh, can do. And where does IPC fit into this? And 
<clears throat> when we see more integration taking place, what's really going to be the future role of, uh, of IPC? I know we've talked about uh, that from, from some points of view, um, but there needs, to be, there needs to be a lot more. Um, I, I also believe that, you know, having everyone talking today about ICSPE and IPC and UN and UNESCO and, and VISTA and IFAPA and the topics that we discuss, maybe we have to come to the realization that we need a, a major worldwide think tank at some time in the future. Remember that while we are young as uh, the Paralympic sport and sport for athletes living with it, or for people living with a disability, we still are 75 years old or more. And have we really achieved a lot given those 75 years? I begin to think of more marginalized groups, groups and uh, because of some of the research I'm involved with right now, I think of our, our indigenous groups and the, and the huge percentage of disabilities that's occurring in, in those groups. It's astounding. So uh, it just, uh, as I say, my mind is spinning. Uh, I want to particularly single out um, <clears throat> Amy and Jenny and Juan Pablo, uh, you guys have been so great today and very inspirational. And, and Juan Pablo, it's so nice to see you again. We haven't crossed paths for a couple of years now, but the work you're doing is, 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 is so crucial. And the work, Amy, that you and Jenny that are doing is so important to our, our future. And I I just can't think right now uh, until Eli and David and a few of us get together and say, what can we do going down the road to tackle this huge worldwide problem? And not problem, this worldwide opportunity, um, because I think we can make an impact, but we have to hold a, a major worldwide with the right people handpicking those right people who can talk about what we talked about today with Amy and Jenny and uh, uh, Juan Pablo. It was, uh, it was most interesting. I, I'm, I'm just at awe of, you know, listening to everyone and to thank all the participants today, you know, and, and to see, can, uh, you know, Ted and Mary continued to be an important part of our team and all of you that participated today. Uh, uh, you know, the brainwave of Eli and David to start uh, the Steadward Talks uh, has been uh, uh, has been very, very good for me personally. And I and when I'm dead and gone, I hope they'll continue it as as well, because they're going to be around a lot longer than than I will. That's for sure. But but thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. This was a this was a real treat today. Thank you, Dr. Sedward, for your concluding comments. I want to also reiterate my thanks to my colleagues Ted, Mary, and Eli uh, for helping get this off the ground. Um, I did put a note in the the chat function that this video recording will be uploaded onto the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity website. Thank you, Quack, uh, for doing that. Greetings to my colleagues that I know from Ixbay, uh, IFAPA, from Commonwealth Games Canada, and greetings to those who I have not had a chance to meet uh, personally. To conclude, Jenny, Amy, and Juan Pablo, thank you so much uh, for agreeing to do this. When we asked you, it was without hesitation that you uh, agreed almost, almost immediately to participate in this, and we're, we're grateful for that. And I want to reiterate Dr. Sedward's comments that this has been a really uh, an interesting and an eye-opening and I think a real meaningful opportunity to record and to bring together some individuals that have lived experience in a variety of contexts within Paralympic sport. And you're right, Dr. Sedward, these videos will live on and forever in the, the ether there. So yeah, your, your thoughts will continue. On behalf of my good friend, Eli Wolf and I, thank you for uh, joining us. We'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody needs to uh, have some concluding thoughts. 
but you're welcome to leave. We don't have plans for another one yet. It's coming. We just don't have plans yet. Uh, so stay tuned and we'll let you know about our next Stedward talk. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Yeah, thank you all. Happy Wednesday.